Hey everybody, welcome back to the Preacher Boys podcast. On today's episode, I'm going to be going through the Teen Vogue article that recently dropped with Olivia Plath from Welcome to Plathville. I know many people over the course of the show have reached out to me with clips from the show that resonate with them. I know for me, uh, who came late into the show, uh, I really saw myself in many ways represented in some of the conversations that were happening on screen. And so I just want to go line by line through the article. Uh, This is by no means a substitute for the article itself. I definitely recommend you go check it out. It's incredibly well constructed and has some amazing photographs as well. So for the full experience, be sure to head over to Teen Vogue and read the uh, full article, the entire conversation that's happening over there. Uh, But I want to give some of my commentary as somebody who comes out of a fundamentalist Christian environment For those of you that are new to this channel, I spent the first almost 20 years of my life connected to the independent fundamental Baptist movement, which had a lot of crossover into some of the world that Olivia talks about in this article. And so I resonated a lot with her journey, with her conversations surrounding deconstruction, questioning her faith, all all that and more. And I thought it would be really interesting just to kind of give Uh, a little bit of uh, ways that this article impacted me. I don't want to just overshadow her perspective with my perspective. Uh, I want to really thoughtfully listen to what she has to say, while also just kind of sharing what landed for me, what hit in very specific ways. And I'm curious from those of you listening, you know, what stands out to you? Uh, I'd love to hear in the YouTube comments or over on social media, anywhere that you connect with the Bridge Boys podcast, how this article landed for you and where you find yourself uh, in your own respective journey. So uh, this article is uh, relatively long. I have a lot of thoughts I'm going to try to get through. I want to keep my thoughts in order. I want to have a lot of mental clarity throughout this episode. Well, luckily, I've got Magic Mind. Now, I know what you're thinking. What a seamless transition into a sponsored ad read. And while Magic Mind is the sponsor of today's episode, I want to say personally that I don't accept sponsorships that I don't find really, really helpful. And Magic Mind kind of came at the perfect time for me. Uh, As a lot of you know, I am a big fan of energy drinks. I love to get uh, a little, you know, caffeine in my system here and there. But I was really finding that energy drinks were one not really super effective for me. Uh, It's always been that way. I can drink a, you know, twenty ounce Red Bull and go right to sleep a few minutes later. Um, But also beyond that, whenever they did work, uh, it would just work in terms of giving me a little anxiety or getting my heart pumping a little bit you know, here and there. And so I've been looking for healthy alternatives to uh, that kind of caffeine intake and Magic Mind has really kind of answered that call and given me not only something that I can notice uh, gives me a a change or shift in energy, but it's also something that gives me a lot of mental clarity, something that allows me to really focus in on a task. And it contains a lot of nootropics like Lion's Mane, which Uh, reduces anxiety and inflammation, and it's a really, really helpful tool. So I'm just really glad that Magic Mind decided to sponsor because it's a product that I really enjoy using. I absolutely love these things. My wife can attest to the fact I was checking the mailbox constantly when my order was on the way. And uh, so I highly recommend it for you as well. Right now, Magic Mind is doing something really cool for all of my listeners. You can get 56% off your first subscription or 20% off your first time purchase. All you have to do is visit magicmind.com slash preacher boys. That's magicmind.com slash preacher boys and use the promo code preacher boys 20. That's magicmind.com slash preacher boys with the code preacher boys two zero. Try magic mind for yourself and you'll see why I am such a fan of this brand. All right, let's get into this article that we're breaking down on today's episode. When I saw Olivia Plath share this article to social media, I knew it was something I needed to stop what I was doing and take the time to read it. Uh, I was late to the party on Welcome to Plathville. My wife uh, was really invested in the show. And, um, you know, I I always looked at it as like the Duggars 2.0 when it first came on. And it's really not. But at the time, that's what I thought. I was like a fundamentalist family. You know, that resonates with me a long time ago. And it gives me some not so good nostalgia, (laughs) but you know, it's not something I want to commit a lot of time to watching. And over time, you know, as often happens when uh, your significant other is watching a television show, you find yourself glancing up here and there and you start asking questions and who's that and what's going on here to where I started really watching several episodes. You know, I wouldn't say still that I'm a 
uh, massive viewer or somebody that, you know, watched every episode religiously for lack of a better word. But I have watched my fair share, particularly the last season, which is really the focus of this article. And I became really fascinated specifically with the storyline in the show of uh, Ethan Plath and his wife, Olivia Plath, both of whom came from very fundamentalist backgrounds, got married at a very, very young age. And, you know, Olivia started really deconstructing. Ethan is still really desiring kind of the cultural, um, you know, patriarchal systems that were within the uh, environment he grew up in while he's deconstructed a little bit in terms of now he'll, you know, drink or now he'll dance and things like that. Um, the, the underlying systems have really stayed the same, which has caused a significant amount of tension on the relationship and ultimately led to a split later on in the year. And so it's been fascinating watching that journey. I found myself particularly in the episode where they talked through their divorce. I found myself really resonating with a lot of what Olivia was saying. And, uh, you know, I have seen those conversations play out many times in my own life with friends, family, you know, me and my wife have talked about it. Like there's, uh, moments we've had those conversations while they've had different outcomes and we've grown in tandem in many ways. Um, this is a very messy thing to navigate. And I think Olivia and Ethan, uh, their story in Welcome to Plathville really captures that. Um, and it was really fascinating seeing her go from being kind of the submissive wife in ways. You always see that spark of questioning, really that spark keep growing into really a flame and then ultimately leading to her really taking a stand for herself, which I was really, really happy to see. And uh, ironically, on IMDb, I was looking up some info about the show, and she's literally credited as Ethan's wife. And to see her break free from a system that only views her as that, <laughs> not alone just a show, but a system that only views her as Ethan's wife is uh, is really, really cool to see. But let's dive into this article. Uh, it's really fantastic. Again, um, I'll full screen it for a moment so you can kind of see it. Um, some Gorgeous photos done in here um, and amazing, amazing journalism uh, throughout the article. So the title of the article is Olivia Plath on Christian Fundamentalism, Welcome to Plathville and Deconstructing by Brittany McNamara and photography by Mai Wen Raoult. I hope I'm saying that correctly. There's someone named Eric Skorzynski. I can't really be getting people's names wrong. Um, but yeah, this is a really fantastic article. I'll go ahead and start um, start going through it here. Says from the time she was a child, Olivia Plath's life seemed pre-written. She she was, she says, to court a boy under her parents' supervision. Then she was to marry him and have many God-fearing children. She was to look a certain way and act a certain way and to teach her kids a certain way. Now, right off the bat, I'm sure many of you who grew up in similar systems can resonate with this. Let me go ahead and pause this ad here. Um, can resonate with this kind of lifestyle. Uh, she talks a little bit later about the exact connection, so I'll, I'll wait to dive into that. Uh, for a while, the early parts of that tale played out for hundreds of thousands on TLC's Welcome to Plathville, a show following the Plath family, which the network describes as a blonde, blue-eyed family of 11 in southeastern Georgia who share a passion for music, religion, family life, and traditional roles. When the public first meets Olivia, she's in a white wedding dress, delicate train, and veil dragging down the dirt road beneath her feet as she approaches her soon-to-be husband, Ethan. We see vignette footage of the pair's nuptials, smiles beaming and bright, before cutting to what was then present day, the couple in their new place adjusting to life together and away, but not too far from the strict control of Ethan's Christian conservative religious family. This is where the story starts to splinter. The year was 2019. It was the first season of Plathville. The Plath family is the focus of the show, but Olivia and Ethan drive the plot of the first season and much of the four that have followed. Olivia was almost immediately cast as a foil to the family's natural and simple lifestyle as described by matriarch Kim Plath, one in which the older children were raised under strict fundamentalist ideals that prohibited sugar, popular music, access to television or pop culture at large, and in which the children were largely only exposed to other fundamentalist families like theirs. Olivia had alcohol in her home. She liked sugary treats. She had some pop culture knowledge, though she too was raised fundamentalist and had less access to the world than most of us. She was, as she says the Plath describe her, and as some of the know may understand, to be a slight worldly. So just looking at the article so far and kind of reading this breakdown, I'm curious if you're listening, and again, if you're watching on YouTube, drop a comment right now and let me know. 
my experience was somewhere between Ethan and Olivia. So I grew up in a very fundamentalist world. Sugar was certainly not vilified, um, you know, and, um, you know, I've talked about before my, my parents were a lot more lenient when it came to pop culture than many, uh, kids that I grew up with. Um, it seems like within the IFB, there's many different shades, you know, and so you have the ones that say we had no television whatsoever. Then you had versions like mine where it was just heavily restricted. So like we couldn't watch R-rated movies, which obviously when you're a little kid, it's probably uh, not a bad thing. Um, but then we had other layers to it as well. So like, you know, we didn't go to movie theaters. We didn't dance. You know, alcohol was a big no-no. So I have kind of the, I guess, some of the worldliness of Olivia where I was allowed to watch more than the average kid in fundamentalism. I certainly knew kids whose parents were far more strict in that regard. But when it came, comes to things like alcohol, being in the home, dancing, certain things and music, you know, I would definitely lean more toward Ethan's family. So. You know, somewhere in the middle, I, I think people watching Welcome to Plathville will resonate more with one side or the other, depending on their specific context. Um, but anyway, it says here, over the course of the next four seasons, we watch Olivia try to desperately pull away from the family. We watch her clash with Ethan's parents and then with Ethan. She's accused of brainwashing her husband, blame for fissures in the family as it changes radically. As the hyper-conservative values that originally alienated Olivia relax, and as her ties to Ethan's siblings bend and eventually break. We see her questioning everything around her, which strains any remaining relationships even more. Now, this is when I started coming into the show was seeing these conversations because as my wife was watching the show and as I'd be sitting on the couch reading or, or watching a movie, uh, you know, on my phone, looking up at the TV here and there, I would see these conversations happening where, you know, people would be accusatory toward Olivia, people I would later find out are Ethan's family would be accusatory to her of corrupting Ethan or like not being as, you know, uh, staunch on some of the fundamentalist principles that the Plath family was. And that was a really stark um, thing for me to see. And it was something where, again, something I thought was the Duggars 2.0 where I'm looking going, this looks like a reflection of my past. I was starting to see a reflection of my present day because I was having those conversations you know, being had about me by friends who were saying that I had gone off the deep end or by, you know, even, you know, extended family and things that, that maybe weren't happy with the choices I was making, uh, in terms of religion or doing this podcast and so on and so forth. And so, uh, that was a really fascinating, but frustrating thing to see play out on national television. And again, I go back to what I felt reading Ginger Duggar's memoir or Jill Duggar's memoir talking about 19 Kids and Counting. Um, I feel this way about Olivia as well. Regardless of what you think of any of these three or anyone else who's talked about this story in similar contexts, regardless of whether you think they're you know deconstructed enough or deconstructing too much or they should be Christian or they shouldn't, you have to give them a lot of credit, for lack of a better word, for not only having these difficult discussions, which again, many of us could probably resonate with. Um, the thing we can't resonate with is doing that in front of, you know, hundreds of thousands of people on a network like TLC, where, you know, as someone who, uh, I, I hate to say enjoys a lot of the, uh, the TLC content. Um, when you watch reality TV, uh, one, you're getting just a shaded version of many of these stories. But also the viewers of TLC are usually watching to judge, to be critical. They're watching like when I'm watching 90 Day Fiance, you know, like I'm not looking at it like let's be objective about this. Like you have your clear villains, you have the people that you don't like and then you have the people that you do like. And so many people are victims of editing and things like that. And so to be sharing a very raw spiritual journey for a reality TV format is a really crazy thing. And so uh, I want to give props where props is due. Like that's a really brave thing to do. It would be a lot easier for Olivia to kind of just look the part and not rock the boat and try to just navigate this in a way that's not going to bring a lot of heat. So anyway, it says now at Olivia, uh, now at Olivia, now at Olivia, now at 25, Olivia has recently filed for divorce and is smiling broadly in the white light of her Los Angeles apartment. 
She speaks openly and laughs often. The script for her life is in the trash, and she realized it's the story she never particularly liked. One she believes has been written for many women, largely by men, of course, using religion as a mechanism of control. I have to say this too. Um, I don't want to go to um, I don't know if I want to say this. The more that I speak to women who grew up in fundamentalism, and I hear about their experience juxtaposed to mine, the more clear, I'll just say this. It's, it hasn't become less obvious that many religious systems have been created by men. I'll just say that for now. Um, it says, quote, I grew up in the fundamental Christian world, which I would also call a cult. She says, the sheer white curtains on the window behind her fluttering in a gentle LA breeze. I was a pastor's kid. I grew up on a farm. I was homeschooled, so my life was very isolated. By the time I was 13, I was being given books on how to be the best wife possible. So from a very young age, I assumed that was expected for me in life as a woman, and that I was told what was expected of me as a woman was to get married and have kids and to be a stay-at-home mom, and I did not want that. We talk a lot about grooming on this show. Uh, culturally, the conversation of grooming comes up quite a bit. And, um, you know, and I'm sorry for my hair. If it looks insane every few minutes, I'm, I'm trying to figure it out, you know. Uh, but we talk a lot about grooming. I think culturally that conversation has really come up a lot. And, you know, I just talked to Scott Coley on the show. who talked about how, you know, right wing, um, you know, like far right groups have really used that word to describe, you know, sex education and things of that nature, things that are decidedly not grooming. But what Olivia describes here in this article and what probably resonates with 95%, 99%, 100% of women who are listening to this, who grew up in fundamental circles that were similar, what she's describing, being given books at 13, training her to be a good wife, which if you've read the books in the, the circles, you know how horrific some of those expectations are. That is the definition of grooming. Like to give a 13 year old a book and say, hey, start preparing to be a good submissive wife. That is the definition of grooming. And that's a lot of trauma just right there. And I don't, I mean, people who know me know, I don't like flippantly throwing around the word trauma, but I think being told at 13, you know, right around the time you're hitting puberty to go, hey, now you need to start being an adult is a really horrible thing to place on girls, especially with the expectations of purity culture and, you know, not stumbling men and all the other nonsense that gets thrown into that. Um, it says, until now, the world has only known Olivia in proximity to fundamentalism, but after living across the country from her family and former in-laws for about a year, Olivia is figuring out the world for herself, questioning the stories she's been fed. She's looking directly at the dark side of fundamentalism and how she fits into that and slowly deconstructing the process of unlearning the religious dogma that previously shaped her worldview. That, she says, has made the earth beneath her crumble. I think it's really cool Teen Vogue is talking about deconstruction. I, that's kind of cool. Um, she said, that's the hardest part about deconstruction. When you start to question a few things, then you start to question a few more. Then you start to realize the entire foundation on how you're living your life is kind of a sham. I went through this experience personally um, when I moved away for the first time. I think distance is a good thing for these conversations from uh, whatever religious context that you were raised in or whatever toxic environment that is. And I called that process, I didn't call it deconstruction at the time. I called it kicking away at the floorboards. And I still use that language because I think it's a really good way to look at it is we spend our lives living in these theological houses, you know, or philosophical houses if you didn't grow up religious. And we walk around in these houses, never questioning anything around us, never questioning how solid or sturdy the foundation is beneath us. And I think it's important as young men and women. To, you know, when you become an adult or sooner if you can, but usually it's easier when you become an adult to start kicking away at those floorboards, to start kind of pushing your foot down and seeing, is this sturdy? Like all these preconceived notions that I'm kind of resting on, like, 
is this even stable foundation for a philosophical or theological worldview? And so I re- I really resonate with her where it's like, you start kicking away one floorboard, it doesn't fit, then another, then another, then you start ripping up those floorboards. Then you start going a little bit deeper. And then you go like, you know, in my case, you go like, oh, there's a basement down here and it's full of skeletons and really scary stuff. And I feel like I'm in the Airbnb from Barbarian. Um, I need to get out of this house. Um, you know, but it's, it's exactly that thing of like, you start realizing it's all kind of a, kind of a sham. So the article continues here. I'll bring it back full screen. And again, I want, I want a cool, I need need a cool photo shoot likes. I I think it'd be cool. And I like how they brought in, um, they bring it in later. I like how they bring in the kitchen, uh, elements they did some clever things with the photos that kind of really tell a creative story which i thought was that was neat anyway it says i let my parents supervise my courtship got married super young to another kid from a fundamental world it did not really work out for me and um you know surprise surprise i think when you have two people that are extremely sheltered so are essentially um children even at 20 um you know you you can't expect them to have a uh, a great shot, especially considering most marriages end divorce in end in divorce already. Um, you're really setting kids up for failure. And as someone who, you know, I would say is happily married, and and I'm glad I'm married. Um, it, it would have been a lot easier in many ways. And we, my wife and I have talked about this many times. Uh, it would have been, I think, a lot easier in many ways to have really established ourselves first. Um, and we wouldn't recommend getting married young the way that we did. I mean, certainly. So it says Olivia grew up on a farm in the lush Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia on the as the fourth born of ten children in the Meggs family. Up until she was about five years old, she enjoyed a pretty typical childhood, running around her neighborhood, reading books, watching movies, doing things normal kids would. She was what her parents called spirited, a self-described stubborn child with an adventurous spirit. When her parents joined a new church, overnight everything changed, she said. I remember waking up one day and was like, wait, I can't wear my favorite tank top with daisies on it anymore. No, you're going to wear a dress that comes below your knees toward the floor. My dad sold our house and bought land from the pastor from this church and built a new house, started a farm, and my life changed uh, drastically, she says. Olivia's family didn't subscribe to a specific sect of Christianity, she says, but instead went to a non-denominational church that took on a fundamentalist view of religion and the Bible, where her father eventually became the pastor. While the church and Olivia's family didn't affiliate themselves with any particular label, she says the belief she was raised with, particularly the gendered expressions and fundamental faith ideas, were similar to those espoused via the Institute of Basic Life Principles, a fundamentalist Christian organization, also known as IBLP, that promotes patriarchal gender norms and other strict values. The IBLP is perhaps best known for its affiliation with the Duggars, Another family made famous through a TLC show called 19 Kids and Counting and was recently the topic of an HBO Max documentary, Shiny Happy People, Duggar Family Secrets. I don't think that's right. It's Amazon Prime, not HBO Max. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's supposed to be Amazon Prime. But if you are looking for a great documentary on HBO Max, uh, let us pray. A Ministry of Scandals is available to stream right now. Anyway. Um, it says all those people in fundamental Christian worlds have pretty much the same beliefs, give or take a thing or two, but they don't want to use the same label or title because those one or two things that they disagree on are huge things. She says, citing things like disagreements about whether it's okay to drink alcohol or dance. Those little tiny things end up being very divisive because everyone is convinced they know the perfect way to live. In a message to Teen Vogue, Olivia's mother, Karen Meggs, said her family believes, quote, in the fundamentals of our Christian faith. And we're more conservative than some and more liberal than others, adding that they do not fit into a box or belong or adhere to a group. Meg said that if not wearing tank tops was a rule in her household, she was not aware, but said pressure from the church community may have contributed to styles of dress. My husband and I both failed to understand just how much peer pressure our children were under from these opinionated people, and we deeply regret that. She added that fundamentalism is often used disparagingly, warranting a larger conversation around what that word means for her family. This is something that really stood out to me um, in this in this article, and it's something that um, I think there's two things that happen. I I, I don't want to speak for Karen Meggs because I don't know anything about her uh, really whatsoever, 
but I've seen this play out in many similar conversations. My feeling with a lot of these stories where a child who turns like 25, 26, I believe Olivia is 25, 26, um, you know, starts talking openly on podcasts, reality shows, things like that about their experience growing up. Their reality doesn't often jive with the reality of the person who they lived with, namely the authority figure, whether that's grandparents or parents in this case. And I think that's possibly due to two things. One, I think it's very possible that uh, parents do what parents do. <laughs> and uh, what, and this is no hate on, again, Karen specifically or my parents or any other parents. And I'm sure as a parent, I'll probably in some ways end up doing this. I think this is just a human thing where we tend to gaslight ourselves and say like, oh, we weren't that bad or our situation wasn't that bad. Or, you know, like you'll see families do that where they'll go, oh, we weren't that poor, but the kid remembers like being really poor or, oh, we weren't that strict, but the kid remembers differently. And so one, it's just very possible. They have two very different views of the background just due to age and a bunch of other factors and other things going on. And I don't think that's necessarily like a wrong thing. I think it's just, again, two people look at a situation with different eyes and some people are nostalgic about one thing and some people have PTSD from something. So, you know, there's different ways to perceive situations. The other thing, which I also think is very likely is it is true. Karen mentions in the article, um, you know, that, the rule in the house may not have been one thing, but the peer pressure from the faith community that their child was at was another. And I see this all the time, and it's why I'm not a big advocate for, and I haven't been for some time, even when I consider myself an evangelical Christian, I was not a fan of the split from parents going here in a church to teens going to this realm. Because there's a major disconnect that happens when the parents are sitting at church service and hearing this type of sermon that's a lot lighter and more John Maxwell esque. And then kids going to a youth group where a 24 year old youth pastor is standing there and screaming about hell and calling, you know, popular music artists, you know, homophobic slurs, things that happened at youth conferences I was at. Um, you know, like there's a big difference there. And so you're going to get two different experiences. And I think sometimes parents give way too much distance and don't realize that their kids are getting a totally different faith experience than they are. And so I think both of those things are possible. Again, I want to assume not just the worst thing possible about something, but I think that's that's very possible. Um, two reasons as to why that could be the case. And I'm saying that from, again, my own, my own experience and perspective. It says, in general, fundamentalism at large is the strict and literal adherence to a set of principles. So Christian fundamentalism is defined as the strict and literal adherence to principles as set forth in the Bible. But what those principles are, as Olivia points out, rightfully so, can differ. There's so many people in the world, she says, but they all crisscross and intersect together. This is a big thing. Fundamentalists always point to the fact, and I think the definition is kind of flawed. Fundamentalism would mean that you have a fundamentalist, like literal interpretation of scripture. But scholars and researchers and pastors and laymen and fill in the blank all have different perspectives on what the Bible says. So when you say, hey, the Bible says clearly this, you put 20 people in a room, there's 20 different interpretations of what that means. She says, uh, there are so many groups in the world, they all crisscross and intersect at some point. The pastor's daughter, Olivia, attended church and sang in her family band throughout her adolescence, but that curious spirit of hers never left. When she was 16, she started questioning fundamentalism. It's about the time I, I did, 17, 16, uh, which manifested in tiny rebellions, cutting her hair short, wearing different clothes, putting on black eyeliner. I didn't rebel in that way. Uh, that felt earth-shifting to her. It was also around this time that Olivia says she met her future husband, Ethan, at a conference held by Michael and Debbie Pearl, controversial fundamentalist figures whose child-rearing manual promotes physical abuse. My jaw hit the floor when I read this first time in the article. Um, I did not know she met Ethan at a Michael and Debbie Pearl conference. That tells you kind of 
you know, it, it's funny because like she says they were just evangelical, but very fundamentalist. But I feel like they were probably independent fundamental Baptists. You know, it, it it's kind of like when people say they're libertarian, you know, or they say they're centrist in political conversation. You go like, yeah, so you're far right, <laughs> you know, or far left. Like you're somewhere in that realm of like people that say they're in the middle usually aren't. And I think like their church probably claimed like not to be connected to anything, but like they were obviously deep. Like at the point you're going to Michael and Debbie Pearl conferences, like the church is clearly deep down a super fundamentalist rabbit hole. Um, Cause those are some horrific people um, that advocate for some really horrific things. But anyway, that blew my mind and props to her because that's a realm to climb your way out of is a uh, no easy task as many of the people listening to this probably could attest to. Uh, it says in her book, the ex evangelicals loving living and leaving the white evangelical church added to wish list. Uh, journalist Sarah McCammon defines deconstruction as the often painful process of rethinking an entire worldview and identity that carefully was constructed for you. I love that word identity because that's really what it is. It's not just your worldview and your way you see the world. It's how you view yourself. Uh, it's commonly used to describe people leaving a religious worldview, which is something McCammon writes that young people are increasingly doing, Olivia being one of them. That's what these outward changes were, a pushing of the boundaries and just the start of a very slow process when she's still continuing today. Even a few years after she started questioning fundamentalism, Olivia was still in its hold. In a 2018 film called American Family Revival, a small production about Christian quiverful families, a religious movement that preaches having a lot of children to spread the word of God, Olivia appears at 19 years old with her family as they talk about their lifestyle. In this clip, Olivia talks about the lessons she learned as one of the 10 children. One of the biggest benefits I can think of of being part of a large family is that there's always somebody who's doing things right, even if you're doing it wrong, that can show you the right way to do it. I can think of many times where I wasn't being obedient and one of my siblings was, and I could always look at them and be reminded of what I was doing that was wrong. We see Olivia in church watching her dad preach in a clip, she plays the piano, and sings worship songs. Olivia continued to follow that script. She entered a long-distance courtship with Ethan, exchanging letters and talking on the phone for one hour every three months. All that she says was allowed. Olivia's mother said infrequent calls were to allow the pair to get to know one another slowly since they were young. We wanted Olivia to experience more of life and get to know herself better before getting into a serious relationship, Meg said. She started her own photography business when she was 18, which allowed her to travel, see the world, and see lifestyles different from hers. Which again, I'll say from experience, is an amazing thing to experience when you're going through deconstruction. Uh, I worked in video production um, for quite a few years where I was traveling, I mean, almost every other weekend. It, um, you know, sometimes a little less frequently, but you know, I got to go to, you know, 13 different States. Um, I went to three or four different countries. Now at this point I've been to like, I don't know, 12 or 13 countries. Like traveling is an amazing, amazing thing when you're trying to get a broader perspective on the world versus just a kind of fundamentalist interpretation of it. But anyway, back in the article. Uh, she married Ethan in 2018 when she was 20 years old, entering into another large fundamentalist family, one that was, she says, even more strict than her own. Those seemingly small differences in fundamental beliefs played a big role here. Olivia says she began clashing with the Plath family even before the rifts we see on the show, because she didn't fit their expectations. In the safety of marriage, Olivia thought she and her husband could start to explore a world that wasn't so narrow as the ones their parents provided, but she found just another version of the same small box she was raised in. The plasts were not available to comment for this article, according to a representative from Warner Brothers Discovery, TLC's parent company. Deconstruction is such a gradual process. Slowly over time, I started realizing that I did everything right, according to the way my parents wanted. I let my parents supervise my courtship, got married super young to another kid from a fundamental world, and it didn't really work out for me. I felt like I was living in fight or flight all the time. Meanwhile, her travel as a photographer had afforded her some outside experience, like becoming friends with someone who had a live-in boyfriend, which she says she was raised to believe was a sin that would send you to hell. How can something so bad work so well for them, she wondered, especially when she did things right and felt miserable. The cracks in her faith continued to widen. Then came 2020, and that's when Olivia's footing really began to fall away. 
In the earth-shattering days of 2020, when COVID revealed structural inequities, when George Floyd's murder made systemic racism much more clear to the masses, Olivia, like many others, couldn't comply any longer. At that time, I was still attending a church in Georgia and watching how things were handled with COVID and racism, all of these things that were popping up in 2020. Not that these things didn't exist before, but politics were heightened in 2020. Societal issues were heightened in 2020. She says, I was sitting there right in the right spot of asking questions going, wait a minute, this contradicts everything I've ever been told. Here, Olivia pauses. I want to be careful about what I say because she doesn't want to paint all Christians with a broad brush, but it was her community's reaction to the tumultuous year that she's sped up her deconstruction. And again, I can resonate with this a ton. My difference would be it was 2016. It was the election of Trump and the conversations happening there. But a lot of the same reasons, a lot of the same things that, again, are always under the surface, but got heightened. And I'm seeing that happen. You know, 2020 was a big period of that for people as well. Uh, so I remember watching how Christianity uh, handled societal issues and feeling like a lot of people were not seen or taken care of or were judged. I was living in a very small, politically conservative town where wearing a mask out in public, you got funny looks. Voting differently than the people around you became the talk of the town. On the show, this manifests in smaller ways. COVID is largely glossed over and the social upsets were avoided, but we see Olivia face judgment when she wants a belly button piercing and clash with Ethan over plans for a tattoo. She says she started to feel that this is not a loving, inclusive, non-judgmental group. That jaded my view on Christianity a bit, and I think was helpful in deconstruction because it sped up the process of asking questions and digging deeper. And Olivia was also questioning her marriage. She says she felt her religious background had told her that her duty or worth in life was first to God, then to a husband. What about just me? Am I worth something outside both of those? Do I have worth if I don't believe in God the same way? Do I have worth if I don't have a husband? Can my intuition be trusted? Am I capable of being a strong, powerful force without a man leading me? She says. The answer to those questions is yes, but the religion I grew up in told me I didn't. Olivia says realizing her power as a woman and the role these patriarchal values play in oppression are what led to her divorce. And you saw this really clearly, and I'll put the clip here, but in the conversation with them where Ethan kind of explains what he expected out of marriage and Olivia in that conversation really explaining that's not like she's made for a lot more than that. And I think that's a really powerful discussion. If there was anyone on the face of this earth today that I could have kids with, it w- I would want it to be you. And I love you very much, and I wish that that's the way that things could be. But I also, in good conscience, holding the beliefs and values that I have and with the way that you have changed, I can't see how I can do that. There's just things I'm not okay with the children that I raise growing up to think and believe. It's a matter of principle to me. I'm the kid of two people whose principles matter more than a relationship with their daughter. And I will be damned if I repeat that. Olivia continues in the article, when you start to see how deep patriarchy runs, you start to see so many other issues, she says noting how patriarchy contributes to racism, homophobia, and other societal issues. She started questioning that power structure, and it bolstered her progressive views on things like LGBTQ rights and reproductive rights. On the show, we watched Olivia and Ethan fight over her values and how that might impact their future children. There's just things that I'm not okay with the children that I raised growing up to think and believe. It's a matter of principle to me, Ethan says on the show. So if deconstruction is, as McCammon wrote, the painful process of rethinking an entire worldview, Olivia not only embarked on picking apart everything she'd ever known, but she did it on national television. I look back on the last four or five seasons of the show, which is four or five years of my life, and I'm like, oh my God, who is that kid who cries in every single interview and is so emotional? What's her problem? She says with a chuckle. I was 20 and newly married to someone who wasn't ready to leave fundamentalism behind at the same time I was questioning fundamentalism. I had my whole life open for the public to criticize and critique. And I was a kid who grew up so sheltered from the world to be thrown out in it and have everyone watch me as I'm deconstructing and trying to figure out what being married is all about and dealing with in-law conflict. I look back and I'm like, sheesh, it felt very overwhelming. 
Often, it was clear that Olivia was overwhelmed. Viewers of the show see Olivia and Ethan split completely with Ethan's parents, which also separates them from many of Ethan's siblings. In the second season of the show, Ethan says he and Olivia have no contact with his family, though many of them live on a farm right down the road from their home. We watch Ethan transform from a naive and smiley boy to a wary and hardened man, navigating his problems with his upbringing and a rocky relationship with his wife. While Olivia keeps rigid boundaries with the Plath family, Ethan's relationship with his parents and siblings eventually comes back, and he slowly retreats back under the Plath family wing, which causes a rift with Olivia. At times, Olivia's reasonings for her boundaries seem convoluted, and sometimes the boundaries themselves seem too much. A standoff at the gravesite of Ethan's younger brother comes to mind. And her actions to reinforce them can seem like bids for control in an ever-growing power struggle between her marriage and her husband's family. Specifically, many viewers thought she was engaged in a power struggle with Ethan's mother, Kim Plath. And again, I remember watching some of these episodes and kind of having um, my my lens on all of this was, I think Ethan was okay with Olivia questioning until he started in the same way he was questioning. And I think this goes back to the the dynamic of being a man or being a woman in fundamentalism for Ethan. To say, I'm going to question fundamentalism, which means I can drink a beer now, is a fairly easy path to start going down. It still takes some work. It's still undoing some wiring and things, or to listen to music, or fill in the blank. For Olivia, unraveling it meant those things, and I think Ethan was largely okay with going on that journey with her. Where I saw Ethan start getting visibly upset was when what Olivia was questioning was removing power from Ethan. Just like with Kim, when Olivia's actions started removing power from Kim, there started becoming more conflict. And, you know, again, Olivia's deconstruction went beyond just the aesthetics and started getting into the root, which started making everyone who is in that system really, really uncomfortable. And so, yeah, did Olivia messily put up some boundaries? I think so. But I also don't know that there's a way to cleanly put up boundaries in a system that doesn't allow them. So, you know, I never was as hard on Olivia as many people were. And I think for people who are watching TLC who are not coming from from a religious background, they might look at it in the way that they look at any relationship. And I don't think you can look at this relationship the same way. There's too much wiring that's just so drastically different from you know, uh, I mean, the next most comparable thing, which is just a normal family drama. This this goes way deeper than that in many different ways. Um, it felt like a power struggle, Olivia admits, because that's, that's what it was. Uh, she said, I would read critical comments about me on the show, and I would immediately respond to that like, no, I'm not the same as Kim. You don't understand. Looking back on it now, all I wanted was to choose my own life. All I wanted was to be myself and live authentically as who I am. And sometimes figuring all that out manifested in ways she now wishes she could change, which is a regret I'm sure that all of us who are reading the article all feel. I'm trying to sit in this place now, realizing that I should have behaved better and also knowing that I did not have the tools at the time to behave better. It's a juxtaposition of that was a bad choice. I didn't know how at the time, but now I do. I look back to season one and see a scared kid who felt like she was backed into a corner. I saw things as black and white and drew very harsh boundaries. I think that I needed a do-over at the time, or I needed that at the time. It harmed other people, and I wish that wasn't the case, but I don't get a do-over. I want to consistently make better choices. I was literally just talking with April Avia about this, um, I think on the podcast, or maybe not. Maybe it was just a conversation. I don't remember. Um, But I was just saying, like, fundamentalism teaches you to think in black and white, and so the actions you make in deconstruction or the actions you make leaving those fundamentalist groups it's easy to make those kind of escape choices in some regard, because once you identify that something is clearly wrong, it's easy to snap to the other side. And I think it's important over time to understand nuance and the gray, but I think in some ways the black and white think- thinking can kind of launch people out of fundamentalism quicker, ironically, because once you realize fundamentalism is wrong, you can go, oh, it's all wrong, and I'm going to jump to the other side. I think then the work that you have to do is figuring out like, okay, not everything was wrong. How much was, how much was not, 
in the gray between the two extremes, the far right, the far left, the hyper conservative, the non conservative, the atheist, the Christian, what is reality? And, and you kind of like get back to this equilibrium that I think is healthy, but the black and white thinking is a, a monster to deal with. So anyway, while perhaps uh, not on purpose, portraying her process of deconstruction, however messy, cracks open the gleaming veneer that often quotes portrayals of fundamentalism on television. Thank goodness it's about time. 19 Kids and Counting was so ridiculously dramatized and left so much on the table. But anyway, as Shiny Happy People, the documentary on the IBLP and the Duggar family stresses the importance of image in certain fundamentalist communities. The public sees outward projections of traditional perfection, a strong father, a doting mother, and a litter of well-groomed and smiling children to make the fundamentalist lifestyle more attractive, according to the documentary. The fundamental Christian world is very performance-driven, Olivia says. They want to have the perfect family with the perfect kids. It's all very idealized. That, she says, is particularly true when some fundamentalist families get television shows. For many years, fundamentalist Christian families have been given a platform and been idolized on TV without people actually understanding what's going on behind the scenes. Everyone looks at it like these are large families with siblings who love each other and everybody's close, and that's something that's missing in families today. These are families that are living off the land or being out in nature, and there's so many good things here that we're not seeing in today's kids. Tia Levings, a writer, ex-fundamentalist, and author of A Well-Trained Life, My Escape from Christian Patriarchy, calls it lifestyle evangelism, an effort to convert people to Christianity without making it so overt by just presenting it as a desirable lifestyle and often one that's a wholesome alternative to the chaos of the current world. Just really quickly, I did recently interview Tia Levings. The episode, because of uh, restrictions by the publisher, will not be released till August. But if you want to listen to it right now, it is available on Patreon. I link to it in the show notes of this episode. Just a little plug for that. Uh, Tia Levings is absolutely amazing. If you saw her in Shiny Happy People or if you've read any of her work, uh, she's absolutely phenomenal and has a great sub stack as well that I also highly recommend. And uh, so just want to give that a quick plug. And I also, this lifestyle evangelism, I mean, this really resonates to me. I remember the quote all the time. Uh, some people may never read a Bible. You might be the only Bible they ever read. You know, that kind of language was super common. And I think that's why, you know, reading Jill Duggar's book, you know, you see guys like Jim Bob just jump at the chance to be on TV. And there's a little narcissism in there, you know, just, just, just a little bit. Uh, you're going to demonstrate a beautiful aesthetic, the things everyone wants for themselves, happy relationships, a sense of safety, structure, order, and clarity. We all crave the same things, Loving says. It comes with all the aspects of high control religion, all the darker themes we know are true when we start looking at those groups, but they don't lead with that. They lead with, here's a happy family, a pretty baby, a loving marriage, a good courtship, really clear gender roles. It's a comfort to a chaotic environment to see people who say they have it figured out, who seem to be thriving. Seem and say are uh, the key words there, but both Levings and Olivia say this isn't the full story. People aren't talking about what actually happens behind the scenes, but if you look at the fundamental world, if you look at these fundamental families that are put on pedestals, Olivia says there are often skeletons in the closet. So many skeletons, perhaps you could do a full podcast on that topic. Olivia names the Duggar family as an example. The family starred in the show 19 Kids and Counting, which ran on TLC. The same network Plathville is on for nine seasons until it was canceled after news broke that Josh Duggar, the family's oldest son, had allegedly molested five underage girls, some of whom it was later revealed were his sisters. While Duggar was never tried for these allegations, he told people at the time he had acted inexcusably and hurt others, including his family and close friends. He said he confessed his wrongdoing to his parents when it happened. When that show was canceled in 2015, the family got a spinoff called Counting On, which ended the same year that Josh Duggar was arrested for possessing and receiving child <laughs> Josh Duggar never appeared on Counting On. He was later convicted for his offense. Duggar appealed his conviction, but his appeal was denied. There's no suggestion that Welcome to Plathville has any of the same kind of skeletons like the abuse that overshadowed the Duggar family. But speaking about fundamentalism at large, Olivia says there's a lot of really ugly things that hide behind it. Multiple fundamentalist leaders or groups, in fact, have been accused of wrongdoing. More than 30 women accused IBLP founder Bill Gothard of sexual harassment or misconduct, 10 of whom filed a lawsuit against him. The lawsuit was later voluntarily dismissed. Gothard had denied any wrongdoing. 
A 2021 vice investigation looks into an alleged culture of abuse and societal control in an Idaho church. The leader didn't reply to their request for comment, but linked to his response a list of controversies he's involved in. Toby Willis, whose father was the subject of another TV- TLC show, is now in prison for rape. Um, I actually interviewed um, Jessica Willis Fisher. That's Toby Willis's daughter. Um, I'll link to that in the show notes as well. Um, her story is fantastic, and she wrote a really incredible book. Um, I thought I had a copy on my desk, um, but her book's absolutely amazing. Um, Jessica Willis Fisher is is well worth following and listening, just a side note as well. So when fundamentalist families are on television, Olivia says there's a responsibility to acknowledge what can be a dark side of fundamentalism. If you're going to idolize a fundamental lifestyle for the seemingly good, wholesome things, you also have to talk about the other side of it where people are being harmed and not believed when they talk about it, she says. Plathfield does show family disagreements and other things that some shows about fundamentalist families might not, which is seemingly a break from the trend Olivia and Levings point out. Still, Levings says it's part of an overall landscape of shows that overtly or tacitly promote fundamentalism. I, this is, I did feel really uncomfortable in the side plot where uh, Mariah, I believe that's the younger sister in the show. It, it's a weird balance, right? Because it's reality TV. It's not uh, overtly a documentary. It's very dramatized. But Mariah on the show, this kind of rubber banding effect of going, you know, I'm going to go find myself to like then being drawn back into the church. It made me really uncomfortable. And particularly the baptism episode, I felt like there's times I feel like the show provides a critical lens to something and there's times it doesn't And that scene with the music and everything played it as a very beautiful reconnection to God or the church. But clearly Mariah's journey to find herself is not done. And so I think it looked at that. I don't know. I don't know the uncritical and even in Dorsey vibe is that a word? And Dorsey vibe of that baptism scene really rubbed me the wrong way when I watched it on, on TV. And I, I do think there is a, you know, there's some irresponsibility there, I think, in the way that that was presented. But I mean, but also too, that's how Mariah views it. I mean, it's it would be, I guess, irresponsible to present it in a different way. I just, that episode in particular, I think really showed that where like it kind of overtly or tacitly promotes that fundamentalist vibe. Uh, anyway, enough of me back to Tia Lovings who always says things way better than I could ever say them. Uh, she says, one of the things fundamentalists do when they get involved in entertainment is they like to show us different flavors that you can trace back to the same root. It's good that we're not seeing this perfect veneer and being able to get a real picture of what it's like in that environment, a more real picture of what it's re- uh, really like in that environment. I appreciate that Plathville showed the cracks, but I do think it's part of a greater whole. In this, in the spirit of portraying a different part of fundamentalism, and in the spirit of being a petty bitch to spite her in-laws, Olivia has said that if there is a season six of the show, she will be on it. A Warner Brother Discovery representative declined to comment on whether there will be a season six of Welcome to Plathville, but on the podcast So Bad It's Good with Ryan Bailey, Olivia said about appearing in a new season, you have to show what happens when someone walks away from it. You have to show what happens when someone questions it. Otherwise, it's not just the full story. I will watch if they do that new season, and I hope that they uh, certainly will. For the first time in her life, Olivia isn't beholden to anyone else, and she's taken advantage of that freedom. She's living in LA for now, which was always meant to be temporary, so she's looking for a place to put down some roots. She's dating, trying to figure out how to shed the shame that growing up in purity culture left with her. On March 25th, Olivia posted a photo series to Instagram featuring a man, which many in the comments suspect to be a relationship hard launch, though she would not confirm or deny the speculations. And she's thinking about how to use her platform to speak to other ex-fundy kids. She's still very much figuring out her life and forging a path away from fundamentalism, but she's excited by a world filled with nuance where there's no predestined story. And just really quick, by the way. Uh, Olivia, if you want to come on the podcast and talk to ex Fundy kids, I am more than happy to have that conversation and, uh, just let me know when, and I would love to have you on the show. That is my public invitation. Uh, feel free to join me on the podcast at any time. And if you don't want to come on the podcast, I'm still happy to watch any of the content you put out talking to ex Fundy kids. Cause we always need more of that content out there. She's still very much figuring out her life and forging a path away from fundamentalism. 
but she's excited by a world filled with nuance where there's no predestined story. Fundamentalism told Olivia there was one right way to live, but that way never felt right for her. In moving away from that narrow view, she's reminded of a story she read when she was five or six years old, right when her life drastically changed. It's this book about how all these blind men were touching an elephant. They were each touching a different part of the elephant and trying to describe what it was like. And they were all so convinced that they were right, she says, explaining that each man in the story described the elephant in a different way. They get into this big squabble in the town square, and they're brought before the emperor who says, you're all right, you're touching a different part of the elephant. That book has stuck out to me so much in the last few years while deconstructing and realizing that there's not one way to live. Faith doesn't look one way. Spirituality doesn't look that way. Looking at the world that way, where many things can be true and many ways of living can be the right one, Olivia feels more at peace than ever knowing there's so much more to the story. I feel very at home with myself, she says smiling. I think curiosity is the theme of my life. I told you guys, it's a really beautiful, beautiful article. Olivia just really breaks down in a great way. And I love that they brought in Tia Lovings to add some extra commentary. Um, But that's just some of my thoughts on the article itself. Again, I find so much resonance with so much of what Olivia said throughout the article and just in her conversations and interviews she has on the show. Welcome to Plathville. Uh, Let me know what you thought. Uh, Find me over on social media, anywhere you connect with Preacher Boys or drop a comment on this video if you're watching on YouTube, X, Facebook, any of the other platforms that host video content. This episode is probably there. I'd really love to hear from you. And would you want to watch a season six uh, exploring Olivia's journey out of fundamentalism? I know I absolutely would. Uh, And I would love to have Olivia on the show at some point. I'm just going to shoot that out into the universe and see what happens from there. Uh, But thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Preacher Voice podcast. Thank you again to our sponsor, Magic Mind. You are the absolute best. And I think you could tell that I have a, a focus, a clarity, a uh, a real uh, energy in this episode. And I want to give all the credit to that, to the incredible sponsors over at Magic Mind. Remember, if you want to get your own Magic Mind, you can visit magicmind.com slash preacherboys. Use that code preacherboys20 to get an amazing discount on your first purchase. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in a future episode.